conceded. Now, I told Keith that I was going to wait until the message to actually make the official announcement, though he mentioned it at the beginning because so many folks are always late, uh, and some who probably will come in yet uh, won't be here for the announcement, so I may make this announcement again a little bit later on. Um, as he mentioned to you, the Institute for Creation Research, that's the group that puts out Acts and Facts, which we get uh, every other month, and the Days of Praise, which I know many of you use, they are actually, that was the group founded by Dr. Henry Morris, sort of the grandpa of the creationist movement in the United States. They have moved from California, from El Cajon, California, as you know, several years ago, to Dallas, Texas. Great place to be, it's where Dallas Seminary is located. And um, they're in the process of building a creation museum. Similar to, but quite distinct with some very outstanding displays like the Creation Museum built by Ken Ham. And uh, that is gonna be going up in Dallas. And um, I have just obtained the new DVD about that. This is a little tiny promotional DVD. It's only five minutes long. That museum is going to be called the Dallas Museum of Science and Earth History. And um, although we're going to continue with our series on Islam and the fact that it is not a religion of peace, and in fact, uh, we'll be talking about jihad uh, this coming Wednesday evening, and then there will be two Wednesdays off because of the Christmas Day service and the New Year's Eve service. Um, so I'm going to be showing this this Wednesday evening. We encourage you, be on time, uh, so that you'll ha have a chance to see this. It's only five minutes long, so you can't come in in the middle of it. If you miss it, you miss it. Uh, and uh, some really incredible, exciting news in relation to that. So that's this Wednesday evening, Dallas Museum of Science and Earth History. We encourage you to be here for that. Now, please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, over to the book of Exodus, chapter 12, where I read just a few moments ago, verses 1 through 20. And I'm going to give a recap very quickly here because we have to tie in today with some extremely important things that apply the Passover to the New Testament, not just to Jesus fulfilling it, coming as God's lamb into the world at Christmas time, which we talked about somewhat extensively last week, but how that applies to Christian living. How does the Passover apply to you here in 2015? And if you live till next year, 2016, and every year thereafter until the rapture. How does the Passover apply to the way in which you live? What is it that Jesus did at Christmas that changes not merely your eternal destiny, but what changes the way in which you live here and now, the Christian life, if you will, the way in which you demonstrate Christ to the world, the way in which you demonstrate Christ at work and in your home and in your thought patterns and in your speech patterns, in your motives, in your attitudes. How does Passover, 1444 B.C., 1445 B.C., back in those range, how does that affect the way you are supposed to live today. And the New Testament, I think, makes that very clear for us. So I'm doing a quick recap so that you'll put it into the, the same nutshell and see this all in one piece. Remember, God gave seven feasts to Israel. Passover is one of those seven divine feasts that are explained in the New Testament in their fulfillment. We looked briefly at two other feasts last week that Israel celebrates in addition to those that God gave. There is Purim, which means lots. That's described in the book of Esther, instituted by Mordecai at the suggestion of Queen Esther, uh, how God delivered the Jews from their enemy Haman. The other feast not commanded by God in the Old Testament is the eight-day feast of Hanukkah, which began last Sunday evening at sunset, and it ends tomorrow, that's Monday, December 14th, at sunset. It's called the Feast of Lights or the Feast of Dedication in the New Testament. It's mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 22. And it's celebrated beginning on the 25th of Chislu, the Jewish month that roughly corresponds to our month of December. It commemorates the purifying of the temple. And you remember I went over the history of that purification of the temple, how Antiochus Epiphanes 
desecrated the altar at the temple in Jerusalem by sacrificing a pig on the altar. And then he sent his emissaries all around the country, telling them to command all the different priests to sacrifice pigs. When they got to the little tiny town of Modin, the priest there in Modin took the sword and instead of killing a pig with it, he killed the emissary from Antiochus. And he and his sons uh, started what was called the Maccabean Wars. Judas Maccabeus, his oldest son, was the one who led in that, and that's about 164 BC. It's a real fascinating history. It's prophesied in the book of Daniel. We talked about that to some extent last week. But so that we could see in the study how Passover connected to Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights, we looked at that feast in John chapter 8, verse 12 and following. And Jesus said unto them, I am the light of the world. Remember, Hanukkah is the Feast of Lights. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Taking that back, what has happened just before Passover, as we've been reading the book of Exodus, total darkness. You've either got light or you've got darkness. Chapter 9, he continues, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Chapter 10, he continues, and it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple of Solomon's porch. Jesus declaring himself to be the light in the midst of the darkness. Jesus, the Passover lamb, who is about to be sacrificed, declaring himself light in the darkness. Jesus, the one who is the light, who is about to be sacrificed as the Passover lamb to deliver us from our sins. The New Testament gives us the continuum, the picture of what's happening. We talked about the lamb being observed for three days. We talked about the seven-day feast of unleavened bread and saw that that entire last part of Exodus chapter 12, which we've just read, deals with the feast of unleavened bread because leaven is a picture and type of sin. Paul says so in the book of 1 Corinthians. That's not just sin past. That's not just sin past. That's your sins present too. And that's what brings us to the way in which we are to live the Christian life. Passover and then unleavened bread, unleavened bread, unleavened bread, unleavened bread, unleavened bread, unleavened bread, the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. Seven is a type of perfection, completion. What is Passover supposed to do in the life of the believer? It's to introduce you to a life of holiness and purity, a life that walks away from sin, a life that avoids sin, a life that seeks to stay pure from sin, a life that leads holiness whereby others can see it and not perceive it in your life. Sin and filthiness. We saw it was inseparably connected to the Feast of First Fruits, which falls during Passover, specifically foreshadows the resurrection of Christ. Paul says that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It ties us to the Gospel, which is also in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and Romans chapter 1, who Jesus is and what he did. We saw the symbolism of the other elements of the Passover meal that God gave in addition to the Lamb. We looked at the meaning of the four cups of the Passover Seder, the cup of sanctification, the cup of praise, the cup of redemption, the cup of acceptance or anticipation. We looked at the Haggadah, which tells the story of the Passover. It reminds the Jews that God gave them four promises in Exodus chapter 6. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. I will take you as my people and I will be your God. And that is future. That is coming. So the Passover not only looks to the past. It not only is a point of remembrance, it's a point of hope in the future. We had the Lord's table last, last week. And, and we saw that whenever we take of that, Jesus said, you'll do this till I come. Every man that hath this hope in him does what? Purifieth himself, even as he is pure. First John. Passover is a punctiliar action. It happened at a point of time, but it has continuing repercussions into the future, and that includes right now the way in which we as believers are supposed to live. Christ came into the world to save sinners, not merely save sinners so they could go to hell, give them a fire escape policy, but to save us from our sins. To save us from our sins. Dear people, what, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin, not sick to sin, dead to sin, live any longer there in Christ died for our sins? That's Passover. 
Oh, dear ones, that's why Jesus came. He loved you enough to die for you. True love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But then Jesus adds the phrase, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Don't skip that part of the verse. What do you think God thinks of it when you mock the death of his son by the way in which you live? Can you imagine somebody who loves you so much that he dies in your place? You're guilty. You're about to be executed by hanging or by the electric chair. Suppose it's a, a young lady and a man comes up and says, I will take her place because I love her. And he takes the bullet for her. He stands in front of the firing squad. He takes the noose. He gets hung. He sits in the chair. He's electrocuted. They inject the chemicals. He's killed. What would you think of that young lady if she sort of laughed as she's putting on her makeup and saying, he was a jerk? What a fool he was. What would you think of her? Dear people, when you and I continue in sin, saying, the grace of God will cover it. Dear people, the Passover lamb came not merely to die for your sins, to give you a fire insurance policy from hell, an escape ladder out of the pit. He came to die for your sins, that you could be holy and pure before him. Oh, dear people, do you understand Passover? Do you understand Passover? I showed you a beautiful Seder plate last week that I gave to Judy when we got engaged in Israel. We talked about the six different little cups on that plate and all the things that they mean, the etzah, the zerah, the maror, the karkas, the haroset, the root vegetable. Then I took you on a whirlwind tour. They reach back into the Old Testament prophecy, Titus, with the Christmas narrative, the Jewish feast of Hanukkah, the declarations of Christ for which they wanted to stone him in John chapter 8. The heresy of reincarnation, that's a grotesque heresy. There used to be people in this church that believed it and pushed it. We talked about Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. The prophecies that Elijah the prophet would announce the coming of the Messiah and why they set a Passover cup. For Elijah, every practicing Jewish household does on the Passover table because they really believe with all their hearts that Elijah is going to come to announce the Messiah. It's in remembrance of God's promise to Israel. I will bring you again into the land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for an heritage, for I am the Lord. They're teaching their children to believe and to expect that Elijah will come and that the Messiah will come. Oh, they're blind, we know. We'll talk about that a little bit more today because I want to discuss judgmental blindness today. We didn't get to that last week. And then they close with the words, next year in Jerusalem, because they are not yet all home. Some are there, but they are not yet all home. There's coming the day when all Israel shall be saved. We looked at that first passage that prophesies that typologically in Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration. Elijah is going to be one of the two witnesses along with Moses that appears before the second coming at the end of the tribulation period. The two witnesses that are listed in the book of Revelation Two men who did not die in the way that you see death taking place throughout all of human history, Moses and Elijah. God buried Moses and Satan fought over his body. We learned that from the book of Jude. Elijah was taken up with the whirlwind into heaven. And those are the two who appear in Matthew chapter 17 at the Mount of Transfiguration talking with Jesus. And it's in that context the disciples asked him saying, why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? In other words, look, Jesus, you're here, but there was Elias, and we didn't see him come before you showed up. Why do the scribes say that Elias must first come? 
And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall, they also, do, shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. That revelation is explained, as we saw last week, in the Christmas narrative. In Luke chapter 1, verses 12 and following, where we find the angel Gabriel appearing first to Zacharias and then appearing to the Virgin Mary. And we are specifically told, the angel says specifically, he shall go before him, speaking of John the Baptist, he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient of the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now there's no reincarnation going on there, but a prophetic declaration of the power and spirit of Elijah manifested upon and through John the Baptist. Not a reincarnation of Elijah. Just like Elisha was not a reincarnation of Elijah when he asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit in 2 Kings 2.9. I read you that entire chapter last week, but we're not going to go back there again. He says, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And as the chariot of fire separates Elijah from Elisha, he sees him going up and says, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, its horsemen. That's the Shekinah. Oh, I wish we had time to talk more about that. I love the city of the Shekinah glory. And the mantle falls off of Elijah, and Elisha picks it up. And he goes back to the Jordan River, and he smites the Jordan River. And he says, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And we find twice as many miracles performed by Elisha as by Elijah. A double portion of the Spirit of God rested upon him. That's a fascinating study. John the Baptist did no miracles. We're not talking about the ability to do miracles when we're talking about the power and the spirit of Elijah here. The Bible tells us specifically that John did no miracles. And so this is not a matter of miracles. It's a matter of prophecy that was given concerning the power with which he would speak. And that brought us back to John 10, the Feast of Dedication, the Feast of Lights, because that was the context in which it said, John did no miracles, but all the things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. That's the full circle, and I hope you could follow it. I've, I went over it in detail last week. I've gone over it very briefly today to bring us to our point for today. That brings us to the other passage that connects the transfiguration to Elijah, Moses, and we find it in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 9. He said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Interesting phrase, till they see the kingdom of God come with power. After six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said unto Jesus, Peter always had something to say, Master, it is good for us to be here, even if it was stupid. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. Although that does tell us, approximately what time of the year this took place. And he wist not what to say, for they were so afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And suddenly when they looked round about, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. Stop talking and listen. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. He prophesied his resurrection in this context. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another, what the rising from the dead should mean. And it's in that context we see the same question. They asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. He's now giving them more information about his death. He's told them about the resurrection. What in the world does that mean? 
you have to put that in the context of somebody who has died. But I say unto you, Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed, as it is written of him. Now we have to ask a question. And this brings us to what is perhaps the key point of the message today. Because it applies to us. And whether or not we are living in holiness as a result of the Passover sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God's lamb given at Christmas. Not so that you could do what you want, but so that you would be empowered to do what you ought. Remember that. Not so that you can do what you want, that's the flesh, but so that you can be empowered to do what you ought to do. So here's the question. Why are the Jews not able to see the truth when it is so plain? We've just looked at all these feasts. We've looked at the way that they connect with each other. Even with the extra biblical feasts, how God used them and portrays them in the Gospels to point to Christ. Why can't the Jews see it? The answer is two words. Judgmental blindness. Judgmental blindness. Their hearts have been blinded until the fullness of the Gentiles shall be come in. But even though they are now in blindness, God has not cast them away. Now I did a whole series on the promises that God made to Israel about the land. That was months and months ago. Perhaps some of you remember that. But we need to emphasize it in a different context now. God has not cast them away. In fact, God inspired an entire chapter of the book of Romans to declare his faithfulness to national Israel. And I think that's a pretty powerful de declaration in one of the most powerful books of the entire New Testament. I'm going to read some out of Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Paul is clearly talking about Jews. He's not talking about the church. Seed of Abraham. Well, there are a lot of people who say, well, we're, we're the seed of Abraham, you know, by faith. Okay? So which tribe are you from? Tell me. Paul talks about tribes here. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul's talking about Jews, not the church. Hath God cast away his people which he foreknew? Watch ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? Ah, here we're back to Elijah. Remember, we've just seen Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. We've just seen his connection, according to Malachi chapter 4, with the forerunner of the Messiah, the one who's going to declare the Messiah. So here Paul is going to be talking about Elijah, how he makes intercession to God against Israel. Now, are we talking about Israel or the church? You know, Elijah doesn't make intercession to God against the church. No, he makes intercession to God against Israel. He's clearly talking about Jews. He's an Israelite. He's of the seed of Abraham. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Elijah's making intercession, praying against Israel. Israel Elijah was not praying against the church. Saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. <laughs> you know, so often we feel like we're us four no more. This little teeny weeny group of people here, we're the only ones who are faithfully holding out against the flood that's coming in. Nonsense. Don't have a pity party for yourself. God has a purpose for this church. That's why it's still here. God has a purpose for each one of you, no matter how young or how old you are. God has a purpose for you. We're going to talk about the purposes of God in just a moment. He has a reason for you being here. He has a reason for you being involved in this particular set of conflicts here. He has a reason for you being attached to the history that is here. Everybody else may not know about you. You may not know about everybody else who's out there fighting battles either. I have reserved for myself 7,000 men that have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. That's a lot of people. It's not women and children. It says men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. It's not all the little munchkins out there. It's men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Are you a man? We've got some men here. 
Are you a man who has not bowed the knee to the image of Baal? I hope so. Now look at verse 5, because this is a key principle throughout all of Scripture, and it's a key principle in relation to what we're talking about today. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. That's what I call the remnant principle. You will not be able to find any point of time in all of the history of the world where God has not saved out a remnant that he has chosen for himself to demonstrate that he is God and that no matter how badly the devil attacks, no matter how bad the world attacks, no matter how bad the flesh attacks, God saves out a remnant. And from the remnant, he can build his kingdom. He can rebuild the world as he did in the days of Noah, Noah and his wife, three sons and their three wives, and by them was the entire earth overspread. A small band of apostles, most of whom were martyred for their faith, and yet his word is spread around the globe. The remnant principle. Remember it, Romans 11:5. there is a remnant according to their free will choice. Is that what it says? According to how well they can hang in there by themselves, by tooth and toenail they have hung on. No, that's not what it says. According to the election of grace. Election is not based on works. Election is not based on whether or not God looked down the corridors of time and saw that you were a pretty good guy and so he decided to choose you. Election of grace. The grace of God. He looked down and said, who's the worst person I could pull out of all that rubbish and mess and filthy sewage down there? Who is the very worst one? And he said, there's one. There's one. There's one. We have nothing whereof to boast. It's grace. Verse 6, and if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. In other words, the grace of God was overwhelmingly at work even under the law. He's been talking about Israel, remember? He's been talking about Israel in rebellion to the law. He's been talking about Elijah saying, God, you know, I'm the only one left. They've all rejected your law. But the grace of God was at work even under the law because there was an election, a remnant according to grace. None of them deserved it, but God said, I'm choosing some out. If you're saved, you're part of the remnant principle. We see it in every age, every dispensation. A remnant that God mercifully has plucked as a brand from the burning, as John Wesley's mother said of him. A brand plucked from the burning. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Now this is judgmental blindness. This is what we're focusing on. And the rest were blinded. Now you say, well, uh, how come they were blinded? Were they just sort of tired and they fell asleep? No. It tells you who gave it to them. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. Now that, folks, is a quotation out of Isaiah chapter 29, verse 10. That particular chapter, chapter 29, is the chapter that says, Woe unto Ariel, the city where David lived. Ariel means Lion of God. Ariel is one of the names that was given to the city of Jerusalem. So this is God's judgment against Jerusalem, and Paul is quoting it here. In Romans chapter 11, verse 8, verse 9, and David said, and by the way, this verse, verse 9, is also quotations, but from different books of the Old Testament. Here, Paul is going to be quoting David in Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23. And by the way, whenever you see that kind of thing like bold face, you know, oh, that's a quotation from the Old Testament. You know, a lot of times the Bible, it'll your Bibles may show it in boldface or in italics or something to indicate here's a quotation out of the Old Testament. And then you look in the margin all excited and say, where's that from? And a lot of times they don't tell you. I got a lot of Bibles and they all show that these things are quotes, but you know, a lot of them do not tell you where they came from. So you'll have to do some digging. You'll have to do some looking. You have to get a concordance. You have to look it up. 
but it is incredibly valuable if you do it. That was just a plug for inductive Bible study. So, always look at the Old Testament quotes to see three things. Number one, in other words, look them back up in the Old Testament. Number one, it will tell you which passages are prophetic. Number two, it will tell you what they are prophesying. Number three, it will tell you how the prophecies relate to the Messiah. That's why you look those things up. And here's what he goes on in verse 9. Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Now, you know something? Now, if you looked that up and kept on reading there in Isaiah, uh, or in Psalm 69, you would discover that two verses later, another verse is quoted in the New Testament. But it's quoted in relation to Judas hanging himself. <laughs> you would never know that if you didn't read the entire psalm and if you didn't look up the references. Here's Paul talking about judgmental blindness on Israel and he's quoting out of Isaiah and then he's quoting David out of the Psalms and if you keep on reading you discover that Peter is quoting verse 25 out of Psalm 69 in relation to Judas. Peter's been doing some Bible study and here we have the ascension of Christ has already taken place verses 1 through 8 we get down to 15 after the disciples 120 are gathered together there in Jerusalem Peter stands up in the midst of them there are about 120 of them he says men and brethren this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake and so he's going to quote Psalm 69 by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas which was guide to them that took Jesus and then he goes down a little bit further, is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, let no man dwell therein, let his, and his bishopric let another take. That's a quotation out of Psalm 69, 25. Now back to Romans chapter 11. I just throw those in because people, I hope you get excited about Bible study. Oh, I, I beg you, don't just, oh, I've done my five minutes of devotions today. It will change your life. How diligent are you in your scripture study? How diligent are you in your memory? How diligent are you in your meditation on God's word? Do you not understand? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. It doesn't matter what you hang on to here. It's going to be gone. But God's word won't. How much, how intensely do you want the Word of God? Or is it just sort of a ho-hum, well, I'll get to it maybe. Too busy today. Got some Christmas shopping to do, you know. Well, not feeling real good today, so uh, I think, uh, yeah, I have to do all these other things, but uh, instead of my Bible study time and my meditation, memory study, I think I'll just take a nap. Hey, you can't deprive me of my football game. I know it falls when, uh, when I normally would be looking at God's Word, but football, I mean, the Bible will always be there, but this game, oh man, do you know who's playing in this game? People, where are your priorities? Where? are your priorities. You will give an account someday. So will I. I shudder about it every day. I weep about it every day. I say, Lord, I commit my works unto you. Please establish my thoughts. That's a prayer out of the Scriptures. Martin Luther once said, I have so much to do today, I'm going to have to spend at least two hours in prayer. He understood that only the power of God can get you through the mess of life. Your life is getting shorter and shorter. Your life is shorter now than it was at the beginning of this service. You have that much less time to continue to put things in that count for eternity. Let me move on. Now we have... Verse 10, let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always, quoting still from Psalm 69. Then verse 11, 
I say then, have they stumbled, that is, national Israel, that they should fall? Now here we get to the issue of purposes. Purposes. It'll take us back to the purposes of Passover. Not just to save you and get you to heaven, but so that you could live a life of holiness for God. Purposes. What are God's purposes in the things that he does? I say, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, what is the purpose that God had in the fall of national Israel? What is the purpose of God in their failure to remember the true meaning of Passover? What is the purpose of God in Israel's failure to understand and apply the teaching nature of the law that salvation is not through the law, but only condemnation? Paul continues, God forbid, that is, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather that through their fall, here's the purpose, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. In other words, they were doing a sort of ho-hum kind of living. They were just sort of stumbling along in their carnality and sins. God said, okay, time for a smack up the side of the head. And I'm going to give some goodies to the Gentiles. What? To the Gentiles? <laughs> God says, I'm using that to provoke them, the Jews, to provoke them to jealousy. You've known young couples where perhaps the, the man in the, of the two is not, <laughs> not paying very much attention uh, to the, the girl. And you know, she says, how in the world can I provoke him to pay more attention? And so while he's standing there, she go, goes over and sweet talks to another guy. And does he get jealous? How many thinks he gets jealous? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we see a few hands out there, still a few young people, still a few who know what's going on down in that world of the Netherlands below the clouds. God says, I'm giving blessings to the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. And then he explains it further in verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, because of Israel's disobedience, God put them on a back burner for a while. But that meant that you and I as Gentiles got moved up to the front burner. We started getting God's attention. We started getting the blessings that God was putting into the pot for us. It was because of the fall of Israel. But listen to what he says. If the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles. Yeah, when that bad stuff happened to them, God gave good stuff to us. Look at the next phrase. How much more their fullness. Do you really want to see blessing? Do you want to really experience the incredible goodness of God? Pray for the fullness of Israel. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I provoke, I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, that is the Jews. He said, I'm an Israelite, I'm a Benjaminite, I'm in, from the uh, seed of Abraham, and might save some of them. Now, verse 15 explains it. For if the casting of the, away of them be the reconciling of the world, when they got cast away, Gentiles got pulled in. Did you get that? If God had chosen not to put Israel on the back burner because of their sins, he didn't cast them away entirely. Paul said so in the very first verse of this chapter. But if God did that so that he could bring you and me in, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? In other words, it's nuts to be anti-Semitic. We received incredible blessings through their fall, and we will receive even greater blessings through their restoration. Why should we stick up our noses as God blesses them and returns them to their rightful land promised to Abraham? God's judgmental blindness is followed by his intense mercy. Remember that. God's judgmental blindness is followed by his intense mercy in keeping covenant with the Jewish people, which is what he says in verse 16. For if the first fruits be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Takes us back to the feasts, doesn't it? Oh, there is so much more in here. Haven't even gotten to the part where we're talking about us and how God can put us on the back burner too.
breaking off the natural branches so that we might be grafted in. If God broke off the natural branches so that we from the wild olive tree could be grafted in, a little bit farther down here in Romans chapter 11, be not high-minded but fear. What? Christians? Yes. Fear? Yes. Broken off? Yes. Doesn't mean loss of salvation. But you know what's happened to Israel for the last 2,000 years? Do you know what they've been through for the last 2,000 years? Do you know what kind of instruments of chastening God uses against the church right now in 2015 and he is doing it? to individual Christians, to churches, to groups of Christians, to national groups of Christians? Do you know what he uses? Do you know what kind of pain it causes? Do you know what kind of suffering it causes? Do you know what you can go through if God decides to do to you what he did to Israel? That's why Paul says, be not high-minded, but fear. Our time is up. I'm going to have to stop at that point. Joanne will have to do one more week on this. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, folks. But this is such important material because Passover is not merely an issue of salvation. That's why it is immediately and intensely followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Passover gives the ground, it gives the foundation, it gives the ability, it gives the escape from eternal damnation so that we can enter into a life of holiness, a life of purity, a life of godliness, a life that brings glory to Jesus Christ and not shame and reproach and scorn. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, You've heard me ask this question many times. So you say you're a Christian? How has it changed your life? Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Oh, that we might understand Passover. Not just the initial passing over of the angel of death, but how it wrought transformation and freedom. Freedom as you brought Israel out of Egypt, the world, out from under the bondage of Pharaoh, Satan, and gave them a life that we might be transformed by the grace of God, transformed by the renewing of our mind, Oh, Father, that we might present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Father, we commit these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our closing hymn for today.